This episode is brought to you by Best Buy. Whether you're searching for exciting gifts or trying to snag the hottest holiday deals, Best Buy is here to help. From air fryers for the aspiring foodies in your life to smart watches your fitness friends will love, Best Buy is your gifting destination for everyone on your list. And Best Buy makes it easy to get your gifts how and when you need them with free next day delivery on thousands of items as well as same day delivery and in-store pickup options. Shop great deals on gifts now at Best Buy. Two quick notes before we get started today. Number one, this is a developing story and things are moving quickly. And number two, there is quite a bit of salty language in this episode. So it's probably not appropriate for kids. Okay, here is the show. Admittedly, my first question for Slate Money host and Axios correspondent Felix Salmon was a little sweary. Okay, maybe a lot sweary. When was the last time you saw a CEO tweet the words, I fucked up? Before this week. I, off, off, off the top of my head, um, no, I don't remember ever seeing that before. In, in, I mean, in this case, one who tweeted, I fucked up twice. He's, he's very contrite, but then again, he has a lot of stuff to be contrite for. It's a deserved contrition, and he's correct. He did fuck up. The he in question is Sam Bankman-Fried, also known as SBF, the now former CEO of the cryptocurrency exchange FTX, which collapsed in truly stunning fashion this week, wiping out most of Bankman-Fried's wealth, a lot of customer money, and not a small amount of confidence in the crypto industry. I asked Felix what he would call this spectacle. It is an implosion and a meltdown, but it's also now an actual bankruptcy proceeding in Delaware. So there is a Chapter 11 case happening in Delaware as we speak, and that is now going to supersede everything else. Um, Sam Bankman-Fried himself has resigned as CEO, so he's basically just an onlooker at this point. Today on the show, how a darling of the crypto world and his firm fell from grace— and took a big bite out of crypto's reputation on the way. I'm Lizzie O'Leary, and you're listening to What Next TBD, a show about technology, power, and how the future will be determined. Stick around. Are you ready? Because this has been the worst start to the stock market in 50 years, and Goldman Sachs warns the best case for stocks is to break even. But Bank of America's chief investment strategist has a recommendation. Real assets can offer investors protection against these conditions. Real assets like contemporary art. Because the last time inflation was this high, contemporary art appreciated more than gold, real estate, and the S&P. Masterworks is opening up this contemporary art market to investors with over 550,000 members and $500 million in art under management. Even as recently as August, Masterworks sold a painting for a 33.1% net return to their investors. Masterworks paintings have sold out in minutes, and there is a wait list, but you can skip by using the promo code TBD at masterworks.com. That's masterworks.com, promo code TBD. See important regulation A disclosures at masterworks.com slash CD. This episode is brought to you by Saks.com. A quick scroll of the Saks.com holiday gift guide is the easy way to shop for everyone on your list. They have everything from whiskey glasses to handheld weights to beauty sets to fine jewelry. Saks.com editors have curated the best presents like La Mer skin sets handpicked by the beauty team and cozy Montclair beanies that everyone wants to be wearing for the office commute. For the hardest to please, the editors at Saks.com have picked out Baccarat barware and Versace home decor. Saks digital stylists are even available to give you free gifting help and personalized recommendations whether you're shopping for others or yourself. Plus, free shipping, free returns every day at Saks.com. Let's set the stage a little bit. If I had asked you, a month ago, even maybe a week ago, to describe FTX, what would you have said? That it was the second biggest crypto exchange in the world, 
It's hugely central, hugely important, run by this Wunderkind SBF based in the Bahamas, the place where everyone goes if they want high speed, um, low fee, fast trading in crypto. FTX was ubiquitous. The company bought the naming rights to the Miami Heat Stadium, excuse me, the FTX Arena. They had a fat roster of celebrities doing ads or acting as FTX ambassadors. Steph Curry, Tom Brady, Shaq, and David Ortiz, among others. I call it the wheel. Hmm. I don't think so. And if you were watching this year's Super Bowl, you saw Larry David play a guy who always misses out on the best things, turn it down. Like I was saying, it's FTX. It's a safe and easy way to get into crypto. Yeah, I don't think so. But apart from all the celebrities, the face of FTX, since it launched three years ago, was its CEO, Sam Bankman-Fried, SBF. He is the face of crypto more than any other individual in the world. If people like point to one human being who represents crypto, it's him. He's not only, well, as of a week ago, a multi-billionaire crypto entrepreneur. He's also this like philosopher king who signs on to these very crypto-friendly ideologies like effective altruism. He's also the son of two very high-profile Stanford professors. He's very well-connected. Curly-haired guy, kind he, of like he's got king his, of the nerds. He's got his, like, personal look of, like, kind of schlubby guy wearing shorts on stage with Bill Clinton and Tony Blair. Um, so, yeah, he's very good at use, creating an image, sticking to it, getting publicity, very press-friendly, and really trying to be the sort of acceptable face of crypto going on podcasts and being like very honest about the the shortcomings of crypto and basically just saying you can trust me because I came from the real world I care about people and I'm here for to to make everyone's life better the journey from wonderkind to tweeting i fucked up was frankly remarkably fast on november 2nd the crypto news site coindesk published an article that cast doubt on the health of SBF's other main business, a hedge fund called Alameda Research. Reporter Ian Allison showed that Alameda held a lot of FTX's own crypto token on its balance sheet, a token called FTT. The two big exchanges in the world are Binance and FTX. Both of them have their own token. Binance has this thing called BNB. FTX has this thing called FTT. They're a little bit like frequent flyer miles, basically, that you give out to your users and that keeps your users loyal and keeps them coming back. And if you own the token, then, you know, if the exchange is successful, then the token goes up in value and you can make extra money that way. Over you get above. like discounts and Yeah, it's perks. that kind of thing. Discounts and perks and profits. So there's this whole ecosystem around these two big exchange tokens. What we discovered from the Coindesk article was that the overwhelming majority of the exchange tokens were actually held by SBF himself, which felt a little bit weird. Like, this is meant to be for customers. This isn't meant to be like a way for SBF's hedge fund to make money. And people got a little bit worried about this, especially when they started wondering Look, this is a hedge fund. What it does is it takes on large amounts of leverage. It borrows against its holdings to invest in various other sort of crypto shenanigans. If F if Alameda Research, the hedge fund, is borrowing against the FTT tokens, then that could be really dangerous because what happens if the FTT token goes down in value? People worried about this. And specifically, this guy, CZ, who runs the biggest exchange in the he world. He runs Binance. Binance. His name is Chengpeng Zhao, but he goes by CZ. I don't know why so many people in crypto go by their initials. He's, he's worried about this. He owns a large chunk of FTT because um, SBF bought him out of FTX. There are so many acronyms here. Yeah. It's confusing. But basically, a few months ago, uh, um, Sam Bankman-Fried was like, cut ties with CZ and with Binance and paid him a huge chunk of FTT tokens, then CZ, the CEO of Binance, was like, I don't actually want these tokens, especially after having read this article, I'm going to sell them. And that was the beginning of the end. The larger crypto world smells blood in the water. 
freaks out, and that triggers the crypto version of a bank run. Remember that we're not talking about dollars here. We're talking about crypto. And so what people will do is they try and sell their crypto for dollars. So instead of just taking dollars out of the bank, which is what happens in the bank run, what you have is people selling their FTT for dollars. Which causes the value of the FTT to plunge. Exactly. That causes massive problems for Alameda, which is the hedge fund that is owned by SBF, because they have borrowed a whole bunch against their FTT holdings, which means that when the value of the FTT plunges, they automatically have to liquidate their FTT to meet their margin calls. And so suddenly you get this death spiral in FTT, and or what you wind up with is what actually happened, which is that the amount of money that Alameda owes... FTX, who they borrowed the money from, is more than they actually have. They are insolvent. So so Alameda is insolvent, and then FTX has wound up basically loaning a bunch of its customers' crypto to a hedge fund that can't afford to pay them back, which means that it can't afford to pay back its own customers. There was a brief moment when it seemed like maybe Binance was going to ride to the rescue here. And that both injected hope and then, I think, sounded the final death knell when that deal fell apart. Can you tell me what happened there? So, yeah, basically, SBF had this big problem, which is that all of his customers wanted their crypto back and he didn't have their crypto to pay them back. And he's like, shit. And so on Tuesday morning, he barred withdrawals from FTX, which is you don't do that if you're an exchange. If you're an exchange, you need people to be able to put money in and out as much as they like. The minute that uh, he stopped doing that, I was like, okay, this is the end of FTX. Um, But CZ rode to the rescue, and he's like, you know what? I can give you the crypto you need to make your customers whole, you know, in a deal where basically Binance buys FTX for some presumably nominal sum, although there was some reporting that maybe it would have been for a couple billion dollars. Um, But then, you know, He had to do due diligence on it. And 24 hours after beginning the due diligence, he basically said, you know, the black hole here is far too big. I am not comfortable with the compliance. I'm not comfortable with the balance sheet. I'm not going to buy FTX after all. And then FTX, absent that white knight, ended up filing for bankruptcy. Yeah, it seemed like they just looked under the hood and were appalled. Correct. You mentioned using customer money to prop up their trading arm. That is a Big no-no. If they were a U.S. institution that was regulated by U.S. regulators, that would have been completely illegal. They weren't, but therefore, it's not clear that it was illegal under Bahamas law. They were incorporated in the Bahamas. So I'm not going to come out and say it was illegal, but it was certainly not something that a reputable exchange should ever do. I think if you are someone who is not into crypto or into finance, listening to this is an incredibly confusing alphabet soup of both acronyms, but also like how all of this works seems really difficult to grasp. And I wonder, is it as simple as this guy was playing around with his customer's money? I think underneath it all, yes. That was the proximate cause of the implosion. And if he just allowed his hedge fund to fail... Um, and hadn't tried to bail out with his, with the customers of his exchange, then he would be in a much better place right now. And if he were, say, you know, a, a bank, this is the 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 time when the FDIC would step in. But he is not a bank. Crypto is this wild, unregulated place. Exactly. There is no lender of last resort in crypto. The closest thing we had to a lender of last resort was, ironically, FTX itself. When companies like Voyager started going bankrupt, FTX or BlockFi, FTX would swoop in. These are other trading platforms. Yeah, FTX would swoop in and rescue them. And everyone's like, great, because FTX is the gold standard. It's very deep pocketed. It has the best interests of the ecosystem at heart. So they are going to act as that lender of last resort and, and, and basically rescue the entire asset class from um systemic risk then when fdx itself runs into trouble the only entity that ha- ha- is remotely deep pocketed enough to rescue fdx is binance and they tried for 24 hours and then decided they couldn't 
when we come back. WTF, SBF. Myrtle Beach, South Carolina is the beach. It's also the perfect place to enjoy the holidays. Here, you get all the holiday cheer you can handle, plus 60 miles of beaches and endless fun. Sometimes you need a holiday from the standard holiday celebration. Maybe you want to escape the cold, or maybe you want to start a new tradition. There are themed shows all over the Grand Strand at storied venues like the Carolina Opry and the Alabama Theater. Winter Wonderland at the beach features massive light displays and a brand new family fun zone. Holiday cheer is everywhere you look, like at Brook Green Garden's Night of a Thousand Candles, where more than 2,500 candles and twinkling lights take over the grand botanical gardens. There aren't many places where you can celebrate the holidays or ring in the new year with an ocean view. This time of year is great for horseback riding along the shoreline, fishing from chartered boats or in the intercoastal waterways, and golfing at any of the 80-plus award-winning courses. Take a holiday from the average holiday season at the beach. Plan your getaway to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina at visitmyrtlebeach.com. Imagine having one extra day every week. More time to cook healthy meals, work on that novel, or just binge some good reality TV. What would you do with your extra day every week? Now it's all possible with ClickUp, the productivity platform that'll save you one day a week on work, guaranteed. ClickUp began with the premise that productivity was broken. There were too many tools to keep track of, too many things in entirely separate ecosystems. There had to be a more productive way to get through the daily hustle. ClickUp is the one tool to house all your tasks, projects, docs, goals, spreadsheets, and more. ClickUp is built for teams from 1 to 1,000 plus. It's packed with features and customization options that no other productivity tool has, so you can work the way you work best. Whether you're in project management, engineering, sales, marketing, or HR, ClickUp has easy-to-use solutions that create a more efficient work environment. Join the more than 800,000 highly productive teams using ClickUp today. Use code TBD to get 15% off ClickUp's massive unlimited plan for a year, meaning you can start reclaiming your time for under $5 a month. Sign up today at ClickUp.com and use code TBD. Hurry, this offer ends soon. I think the thing that is so shocking here, or one of the things that is so shocking here, is Sam Bankman-Fried himself. He had very much positioned himself as going to Washington, advocating for crypto to be regulated, and going on podcasts, and talking to journalists, and, and, you know, talking to Bill Clinton and Tony Blair. And I guess I wonder, is there a reality where he didn't really know how bad things were? With, with FTX? Like, why would he be saying, yeah, yeah, regulate us if he was doing this really shady stuff? So that's what he says, right? He put this Twitter thread out basically saying, I didn't know how bad things were and I was looking at the wrong column in a spreadsheet or something or I didn't realize where the lending was happening and I thought there was much less leverage than in fact there was. I, I have no ability to judge whether that's true or not. But yeah, that's that's his story, is that he was unaware of the magnitude of the difficulty at FTX. Um, you know, also it should be noted that all of these problems are relatively recent. You know, it all dates from the past few months. Um, up until then, you know, he really was a billionaire and had lots of money and could afford to rescue people and could afford to try and go to Capitol Hill and persuade them to regulate him. And that was the right thing for him to do then. Do you think he really wanted regulation? Oh, everyone in crypto wants regulation. Because? Because right now it's a shit show, to use a technical term. Like, right now, there's no regulation, there's no laws. The result of that is people wind up incorporating in weird places like the Bahamas because it's the only place they get any vague semblance of regulatory clarity. And they just want to be able to hire a lawyer and say, like, what am I allowed to do? What am I not allowed to do? Let's do the stuff we're allowed to do and not do the stuff we're not allowed to do. That's really, really hard in the U.S. I think one of the things that is striking here is that SBF, Sam Bankman-Fried, seem to, like, grasp that a lot of this was made up and and 
ridiculous. He, and like, he famously went on the Odd Lots pod, podcast with Matt Levine and explained how it was all just built on thin air. Yeah. Right, and Matt was like, that's a Ponzi scheme. Right. I think that's why it seems doubly insane that this is happening. That, like, he should have known. And on some level, he did know. In a previous podcast that he recorded with Matt, he explained exactly how exchanges that lend out too much money are taking on an existential risk. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he was a deliberate risk taker. He was famous in the crypto world for being willing to take risks that other people weren't willing to take. You and I both covered 2008, 2009, and and I really do not want to throw around the word contagion lightly. And yet it does feel like there is this sort of contagion-like phenomenon happening in crypto right now. 100%. So it all started with this hedge fund called Three Arrows Capital, which got over levered and wound up borrowing a bunch of money it couldn't pay back. That caused Voyager to go bust. That caused BlockFi to go bust. They wound up getting rescued by SBF. Um, But in doing that rescue, he wound up taking on a bunch of liabilities And that started creating a bit of a hole in the balance sheet of Alameda Research. So the first contagion goes from Three Arrows Capital to Voyager. The second contagion goes from Voyager to Alameda. The third contagion goes from Alameda to FTX. And now we have the FTX contagion, which who knows where that's going to start. And it could keep going other places? Well, I mean, the two big shoes that haven't dropped yet, the only place it could drop within the cryptoverse that is bigger than FTX would be either Binance, which is the biggest of them all, or Tether, which is this massive stable coin, which everyone is a little bit uncertainty, uncertain how much money it really has. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like people are kind of looking askance at FTX, at, at Binance and Tether. Binance seems as though it's relatively safe and CZ is adamant that he doesn't lend out customer funds in the way that FTX was doing. So I think people are going to try very hard to pretend that they have clarity on what's going on at Binance because that they don't have any choice at this point. But whatever contagion might ripple through the crypto community remains walled off from the rest of the financial world, at least the parts of the financial world where most regular people keep their money. The good news here is that so far there is zero evidence of any contagion from the crypto world into the real world. Because because the big banks have only dabbled a little bit in crypto or because they are subject to the, the kind of regulation that you've talked about? For both of those reasons, and also just because the avenue for contagion is always debt. And normal real people and banks and people and, and actors in the real economy haven't lent money to crypto. So... It's not like I had a bunch of loans to Sam Bankman-Fried and now he can't pay them back, right? Crypto was its own world. Hmm. And it was curiously cut off from, like, the real economy. So one of the questions that I have is, like, the whole point of crypto, or a point of crypto, is that it's supposed to be decentralized, right? That's, That's what they're talking about, decentralized finance. And yet exchanges are centralized. Right. So it seems like it's vulnerable to the exact same thing that its advocates say it is not vulnerable to. So there are two different flavors of crypto. There's centralized crypto and decentralized crypto. FTX and Binance and Coinbase and the companies that you've heard of are centralized crypto. And they are vulnerable to exactly what we're seeing. Like, if they go down, that causes ripple effects and contagion. Then there's also decentralized crypto, which is just a computer program running on, like, the Ethernet computer. And that really um, is decentralized and can't really fail in the same way. And that's things like Uniswap and SushiSwap and stuff like that. I mean, I don't even know what those are. Exactly. No one described FTX as being decentralized. It clearly wasn't. It was centralized in the Bahamas. This all has echoes of the Luna crash that happened a few months ago when, what, $60 billion was wiped out in a couple of days because Terra USD, which is a quote-unquote stable coin, was supposed to be pegged to the dollar and, like, wasn't. Um, I mean, does this sound familiar? Or 
because you you did mention three arrows capital, but this, I don't know, this feels different to me. And that's what I can't quite tease out. Yeah, this is different because what we saw when Celsius went bankrupt, what we saw when Terra lost all of its value was good old fashioned losses. People were buying things that they thought were relatively safe dollar investments, and then all of the money evaporated. And actually, that was really bad. There were people around the world who lost their life savings, and they thought they were investing in something relatively safe, and they weren't. They were, you know, investing in something which because it was to be supposed to be pegged risky. to the dollar. Exactly. Um, in the case of FTX, the losses you, you don't have normal people losses. What do you mean sense. by that? Um, most people don't hold crypto at FTX. They hold crypto at somewhere like Coinbase or they just hold it on their own wallets. Um, the people who are trading on FTX are real traders. They're trading in and out very quickly. They're very sophisticated. They are the kind of people who are walking in with their eyes open and they can ultimately afford to take losses on those trades, not get their money back. That's really kind of okay. That's the highly, that that's the part of the world with very high risk appetite. What we learned in 2008, what we learned again when when Celsius and Terra went bust, was that the really bad kind of financial crisis is what happens when people lose money that they thought was safe. Yeah. And that where you take have people with low risk appetite who lose when money. When a mutual fund goes boom. Ex or, or like when a money market fund yeah. goes boom. That's what happened in 2008. The reserve fund broke the buck. And, you know, even when people thought they were losing 1% of their money, that was considered to be unthinkable. You know, compare that to, say, what happened in 2000 when the dot-com bubble burst and a whole bunch of people who had, like, high-flying dot-com stocks lost all of that money. The negative consequences of that were relatively mild because that was risk capital that people could afford to lose. Okay, but let me push you on this a little bit because regular people not, you know, super crazy intense traders are going to read the stories about Sam Bankman fried They're going to see that there is this big crypto crash happening. And I just wonder if that colors the public perception of crypto. If it means that your normal person who might want to dip their toe in the water or who saw uh, the, the Super Bowl ad that FTX put out there, like, if they think no, and that that hurts this whole crypto experiment. Absolutely, and it should. And if what this does is serve as a salutary reminder that crypto is highly risky and that it is completely unregulated, um, then yeah, uh, it will put people off, and that's good, because there's no particular reason why people should invest in crypto. That's despite relentless marketing from the crypto industry. The whole take a big risk message coming from ad after celebrity ad. These mere mortals, just like you and me, as they peer over the edge, they calm their minds and steal their nerves with four simple words that have been whispered by the intrepid since the time of the Romans. Fortune favors the brave. Why do you think crypto has has captured this certain slice of the imagination that it has? You know, why is, why is Matt Damon out there doing those ads? Why is Larry David doing that? I mean, well, I they, mean, you, I mean, they know, got paid a lot of money. You know but, why they did those ads, yeah. But, like, why is it that the idea is that this is a bold, visionary thing? It goes back ultimately to 2008, right? What you saw in 2008 was a global financial system that just imploded. And people realized that they couldn't trust financial institutions. They couldn't trust banks. You know, they wanted something else that they could trust. And the idea behind it all, if you go back to the original white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2010, hmm. is the, you, the the maybe creator of Bitcoin. The creator, the creator of Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, is was basically I'm gonna you could you can't trust fiat money, which is all just run by governments. You can't trust dollars, you can't trust banks, you can trust mathematics. I'm just gonna do something which it, you, it's a trustless community. All you need to believe in is math. And as long as the math works, you will have your Bitcoin. And 
To a certain extent, that's true. Like one Bitcoin is always going to be worth one Bitcoin. Um, what then happened, however, was that Bitcoin became a speculative investment and people bu started buying Bitcoins in the hope that the value of Bitcoins would go up in dollar terms. And, you know, we have to remember that the amount that Bitcoin and Ether and other crypto has fallen so far this year, just in terms of its dollar value, the amount of that, you know, we've lost probably $2 trillion of crypto market cap in, over the course of this year. Orders of magnitude more than the amount of money that was tied up in FTX, which was like $16 billion, you know? So it's like, two, you know, two orders of magnitude greater than that. So people are losing real money just in terms of the value of their crypto going down, much more than they're losing money because FTX went belly up and they had money in FTX. But aren't those two things tied together in terms of public perception, right? If if there's the idea out there that crypto, I'm using air quotes that listeners can't see, is is shaky, or maybe that, that the people running exchanges are doing shady things, doesn't that affect the value of that Bitcoin? Doesn't yeah, that absolutely. affect? Absolutely, and, and if you right, look it's at all what, perception. If you look at what happened to Bitcoin this week, you know, as FTX was imploding, the value of Bitcoin went down because yeah. people are like, "I don't trust crypto anymore." Makes perfect sense. So, where ultimately do you think the FTX implosion leaves the larger crypto world? Hobbled, severely damaged. Hmm. It's really hard to recover from this. It's not fatal. You know, Binance is still going. The DeFi protocols are still going. The Ethereum computer is still ticking along. You know, crypto still exists. Uh, but as you say, the dream of the crypto world is always that it wouldn't just be a bunch of nerds trading pictures of monkeys, right? That it would wind up expanding, you know, in... SBF's dream to be something you would use to buy a banana. I don't think anyone is going to buy a banana with crypto at any point in the foreseeable future. Felix Salmon, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I love being here. It's always a pleasure being in your studio. Felix Salmon is the host of Slate Money and the chief financial correspondent at Axios. And that is our show for today. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell. Our show is edited by Tori Bosch. Joanne Levine is the executive producer for What Next. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio for Sleep. TBD is part of the larger What Next family, and it's also part of Future Tense, a partnership of Slate, Arizona State University, and New America. And if you're a fan of the show, I have a request for you. Become a Slate Plus member. You get all your Slate podcasts ad-free. Just head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. All right, we will be back next week with more episodes. I'm Lizzie O'Leary. Thanks for listening. This episode is brought to you by Best Buy. This year, let Best Buy be your holiday hype partner. Whether you're searching for exciting gifts, trying to snag the hottest holiday deals, or looking for ways to simplify the giving and receiving experience, Best Buy is here to help. Best Buy has the best assortment of impactful tech gifts, along with fast and free fulfillment options and great deals all season long. Maybe you're looking for an air fryer to help the aspiring foodie in your life unlock new recipes, or a new phone or camera for an aspiring filmmaker who's turning their passion into a side gig. Or you might be on the hunt for a new smartwatch to support a friend's wellness journey. No matter what you're looking for, Best Buy is your gifting destination for everyone on your list. And Best Buy makes it easy to get your gifts how and when you need them with free next day delivery on thousands of items, as well as same day delivery and in-store pickup options. Shop great deals on gifts now at Best Buy. 